Well, I hope everyone had a good break. Um, we need to keep going, though. All right, we need to keep moving. Um, I, don't, I don't have the average for the test. I don't recall what it was. I, I, I believe after the curve, it is up above a 70. I want to say that the, before the curve, the average was like a 68. And after the curve, it was obviously seven more than that. Um, if you have any questions on the test, please just get with me as usual. We can go through it if you feel like you don't understand what went wrong or you think you deserve credit when I took off. Just, just come sit down with me. Um, we are going to pick up exactly where we left off. And I had forgotten where we le left off. So I went back and I watched my YouTube lecture at least the last 10 minutes from last time before the test. And we were doing Lagrange multipliers. So I don't know if you're going to be able to clear the cobwebs out of spring break, but uh, the last problem I did was a problem that I had offered as bonus that I believe one or two students turned in. And then I did that problem using Lagrange multipliers, and it was much easier. And so today, what I'm going to do is just remind you of what Lagrange multipliers method was. And then I'm going to do one more example. Um, and then I'm going to move on to the next section. All right? Actually, do one more example and then show you one more thing after that. So with, with the Lagrange method of Lagrange uh, multipliers, it gives us a way of finding the maximum and minimum values of a function of either two variables or three variables when that function is constrained to some equation. And this method actually extends out. You can go further than a function of three variables. You can go to a function of four variables, five variables. That's what makes it so powerful. And then, um, as you'll see at the end, you can have more than one constraint also. So where I'm going to pick up is when we have a function of three variables, how it is that we can find the maximum or minimum. So what we do is we take the gradient of the function we're trying to find the maximum and minimum of, and we set it equal to lambda, which is some constant, times the gradient of g, where g is the constraint equation solved. Like you get the constant on one side. I, can, I think I can go back one more slide and show you this. There we go. So if you have a, a function of three variables subject to a constraint, g of x, y, z is equal to a constant, then what you do is you find the x, the y, the z, and the lambda that make the gradients equal to each other, or parallel, so they're off by a, a constant. And you also have to satisfy the, the constraint equation. That's it. If you can find those values, that'll mm -hmm. tell you where the max and mins occur. So I thought the, the good example to start would be to do a word problem. And I'm going to do this one right here. So you have the question is find the point or find the point or points on the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4 that are closest and farthest from this point. So you have a, a, a sphere, right? And you have a point sitting out in space. Let me take those points out of there. So there's a sphere and there's a point. So, you know, Earth and a satellite, Earth and a meteor, whatever, d doesn't matter, right? Earth and something. You want to know where on Earth, what point on the surface of Earth is closest to this point and which one is maybe furthest away. So does it, does it make sense to you that the point closest is right here in the blue? The one furthest away would be on the other side, correct? In red? OK, so we would like to find those two points, if possible. Somehow, this is a Lagrange problem. So let's see if you can help me get it set up. What is your, what is your objective function? What is the function you're trying to find the maximum or minimum of? Is, is that it? Is this your f? Read the problem. Find the point or points on the sphere that are closest and farthest. So you're talking about two points in space, right? This one and some other point, right? 
And you want to know a distance between those, don't you? You want to know, want to know when that distance is the smallest and the largest. But see that this point's fixed, right? That point's fixed. The other point can't just be anywhere. Where does it have to be? On the sphere. So the sphere is the actual constraint of that other point. Understand that? So that's actually the constraint equation. The objective function, which is the one we're trying to find the maximum min of, we have to come up with, which would be the distance between two points. So what is the distance between two points? What is the distance between, let's say a point, let's call it x, y, z, oops, and that point right there, 3, 1, negative 1. So what is the distance formula? I always press the wrong button. Um, what is the distance formula for points in, in three-dimensional space? Uh, you could do a vector. You could, yes. Um, but then our, if you do that, you know, well, I guess we could. We could do that, yeah. You want to do that? If we find the length of it. If that's the first thing you're thinking, then I'm willing to go with that. I was going to go just straight to a distance formula, but if that makes I mean, most sense to you, look at it, that's the same thing. it's the same thing, exactly. So let's call it, let's call it um, d for now, the distance. Should be equal to the square root of, square root because it's a length, of the vector that connects these points together, right? So the vector that, let's say, connects this point to this point, wouldn't that be this coordinate minus this coordinate? squared plus uh, this coordinate minus this coordinate squared plus this coordinate minus this coordinate, which would be z plus 1 squared. Do you agree that, that that represents the distance between x, y, z and 3, 1, negative 1? Yes? Any questions on that? We want to know when that's the biggest it can be and when it's the smallest it can be. But we have to be able to live on that sphere, right? So I'm going to convert this d over to a function of three variables, because that's what it is, right? Distance relies on x, y, and z. So it is a function of three variables. Here it is. That's my objective function. What is the constraint equation? So constraint, the book uses a semicolon. To, when you're looking, doing your homework, they say, here's the objective function. And then they put the constraint next to it. So like this. OK, so that's our constraint. Then the left side of this is our g of x, y, z. Follow? Now what we need is to find an x, a y, a z, and a lambda that make this true and make the gradient of this a scalar multiple of the gradient of this. So how many equations am I actually going to have here? Four. four. It'll be four. three from the gradient, and then a fourth one is this one. So let's write down these four equations. The first equation is going to be the partial of f with respect to x must equal lambda partial of g with respect to x. I realize you had spring break, but I am expecting that you are picking up where you left off. Okay, if you have to go back and watch a little bit of the last lecture, go ahead. <laughs> That's where I'm picking up. It's as if we never left. Partial of f with respect to y equals lambda partial of g with respect to y is the second equation. The third equation is the partial of f with respect to z must be equal to lambda times the partial of g with respect to z. And then the fourth and final equation is going to be the constraint equation itself, which is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. Those are the four equations we have to satisfy. Any questions? We're good? OK, let's take the partial. Ooh. 
the partial of f with respect to x. Now that looks bad, but it's just chain rule, right? So we're going to treat y and z like they're constants. What is the derivative of the square root of something? 1 over 2 times the square root of that something, right? So I'm going to have to erase some stuff if I'm going to keep this all on camera. So uh, why don't I erase this? Don't think I'm going to need that right now. So I'm going to do equation 1. If you're doing it on your paper, just work it below. But equation 1 is now going to turn into, OK, this is, we said 1 over 2 square root of all that stuff, right? Which I'm going to call junk times, I, I use junk, that's, I'm paying tribute to my old professor. He used to always do that too. He used to always just write junk. And so I'm doing junk too. All right. Now, that's a derivative of the square root of something then times derivative of what's inside with respect to x. So these are gone, aren't they? Who cares about those? This, though, another little chain rule. Two pops out, right? Two times x minus 3 to the first power. First power, I don't need to write it, times the derivative of what's inside, which is just 1. So that's it. That's a derivative of f with respect to x. That must equal lambda times the derivative of g with respect to x. Now here's g. What's the derivative of g with respect to x? 2x. All right, that wasn't so bad, I guess. We OK with that? All right, now, second equation. Take derivative of this with respect to y. So I still get 1 over 2 root junk, right? Times, now go inside, derivative of the inside with respect to y would be 2 times y minus 1. Is that correct? No. Agree? Yes? yes? OK, you're looking like, yes? Equals, right? <coughs> Lambda times 2y. Third equation. 1 over 2 root junk times 2 times z plus 1 must equal lambda times 2z. And then the fourth equation, remember, is this one, right? Let's just not forget that's our fourth equation. All right. Any questions before I continue? No? OK, what, what I'm going to do, and this is where you're going to run into the issues when you're trying these on your own, is you know, how are you going to go about solving these, trying to figure out what x, y, z, and lambda are. I'm going to solve each of these for lambda. And then I can set them equal to each other, can't I? Do you agree with that? Um, so if I'm going to solve this equation for lambda, I'm going to have to divide by 2x. What do I have to promise you then? X can't be 0, right? If I, um, if I decide to solve this for lambda, I have to divide by 2y, which means I have to promise you that y can't be 0, right? And if I do the same here, I have to promise you that z can't be 0. So as long as I assure you that x, y, and z are all not 0, so I'm going to say that, suppose x, comma, y, comma, z, all of them are not 0. So x and y and z are all not 0. Then what does equation 1 turn into? By the way, these twos canceled, didn't they? Those twos canceled. Those twos canceled. So what does this turn into if I solve it for lambda here? x, x over 3 on the left side over 2x in the square root of the junk, right? So I'm going to put 2x root. I'm even going to get shorter. I'm just going to root j instead of root junk, OK? That's lambda, isn't it? That's lambda. I'm not going to write lambda. What I'm going to write instead is, well, I'll write lambda, OK, fine. Let's go second equation. What does the second equation become? Same thing, divide through. You get y minus 1 over what? 
to y root j is lambda. And the next thing, third equation is z plus 1 over 2z root j equals lambda. Now, what am I allowed to do at this point? Set them equal to each other, right? So why don't I set, I'm still working here, why don't I set 1 equal to 2, OK? If I set 1 equal to, do, to 2, I get x minus 3 over 2x root junk must equal y minus 1 over 2y root junk. Now, I don't like the root junk. May I multiply both sides by root junk? Yes, right? How can you assure me that the root of the junk will never be 0? Because remember, you can never multiply both sides of an equation by 0. What does the root of the junk represent? Go back to where it came from. What does it represent? It's the distance between x, y, z, and that point, right? Can that distance ever be 0? Not if we're on the sphere, right? Unless that point lives on the sphere, but I don't think it does. So we're safe to multiply both sides by root junk here. And we can multiply by 2, couldn't we? So I, it's going to look a little nicer right now if I just go to this. Right? Now, can I multiply both sides by x? Is x ever going to be 0? Not right now, right? Not right now. So I can multiply both sides by x. I can also multiply both sides by y, can't I? All right, so let's do that. I'm going to continue working. I guess I'll, I'll just work right in here. OK, I'm continuing this. Multiply this side by y, you get xy minus 3y equals. Multiply both sides by x. x goes away here. You get xy minus x. You see how nice this is about to be? Subtract xy on both sides. And you get that, what, 3y is x? That's a relationship between x and y now, isn't it? Now, that was me just solving one of the, or setting just two of those equations equal to each other. What if I go and I set the first equation equal to the third equation now? I'm probably going to get another relationship, right? So you want to go ahead and do that? Any questions on this? See, all right, I'm seeing some glazed looks. Is that could just be spring break still? OK, what if I set equation 1 to 3 now? Then, yeah, it should get a relationship x and z. Let's see. That's, that's equation 1, right? That's this. Now, the third one I erased. But it was uh, z plus 1 over 2z root junk, wasn't it? Do the exact same thing we just did. Multiply both sides by root junk. Multiply both sides by 2. Both, multiply both sides by x. Multiply both sides by z. You should get xz minus 3z equals xz plus x. Y'all understand what I'm doing there? OK, xz's cancel. You get negative 3z equals x. Now I have a relationship between x and z, don't I? Let's get one more relationship. Well, maybe we don't even need it. Let's see. I don't think I need it, because what's my fourth equation? The constraint, right, which has x, y, and z in it. So I'm going to go ahead and write my constraint down right here, equation 4. With equation 4, I have x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. Now, I know if I, if I leave x alone, I know I can just say x squared. But what can I replace y with? So come back over here. Be careful here. I can solve this for y and replace it with 1 third x, right? Take that, plug that in here. Wouldn't you get 1 ninth x squared when you square it? Yeah? Then over here, I could solve this for z. z would be negative 1 third x, wouldn't it? Take that, plug that in here, square it, and you'd get another 1 ninth x squared, wouldn't you? 
Are we good or not? It's all right? These are all common or like terms, right? So how many ninths is that over there? Nine ninths plus one ninth. Nine ninths plus one ninth plus eleven ninths equals four. We agree? Multiply by the reciprocal. X squared should be 36 elevenths. And now take the square root, right? And when you take the square root, you have to do plus or minus. And you take the square root. So when I do that, I should get X is plus or minus the square root of 36 over the square root of 11, which I'll just leave as root 11. Right there, we've nailed down what X is. X is either positive 6 over root 11 or negative 6 over root 11. Now, how can I get y? Remember what y was? I just erased it. It was 1 3rd x, wasn't it? So multiply this by 1 3rd. What would happen if I multiply? Oh, sorry. Let's, let's do this. There's two cases, right, here? Let's suppose x is the positive one first, and then we'll come and do the negative one. If x is positive 6 over root 11, <coughs> then y must be one third of that, right? Which is just two over root 11. And then z must be negative one third times x. So negative two over root 11. That's from here. So I have an ordered triple, don't I? I? I have x, y, z. So here's what I've got so far. I know that, I know that uh, if x is 6 over root 11, then y must be 2 over root 11. And then z must be negative 2 over root 11. Right? That's my x, my y, my z. Something interesting is happening there. I don't know yet what is happening, but I know that that's an inter interesting point. You following me? Now I need to look at the other case. What if x was negative? The y would be negative, and the z would be positive. So all that would happen is this would change to negative 6 over root 11, negative 2 over root 11, and then 2 over root 11. And from, from the geometry of the problem, there should be two points that we're going to find here, right? One of them is furthest away, the other one is closest. <coughs> and we have two. Now, before I stop and we, get, we find out you know, which of these corresponds to the maximum distance or closest and furthest, whatever, um, we did say suppose x, y, and z weren't zero, right? What if they were? What if x, y, and z were zero? Fourth equation, Fourth equation wouldn't work. Right? So if x, y, and z are all 0, then your fourth equation is not satisfied. So we can throw those out. Understand? Now you could write that down you know, to be technically correct. Suppose x equals y equals z equals 0. If they're all 0, equation 4 would say x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. That wouldn't be true, right? So we're done. I never found lambda, did I? Could you? Didn't we solve for lambda earlier? Didn't we solve for lambda earlier? Lambda was like, we solved for it three different times. It was, it was uh, x minus 3 over 2x root junk, right? Well, if you plug in x, y, z into here, you would find lambda. I'm going to pass on that, OK? Lambda here is something, but I know I could find it, right? And here, lambda is something. It could, it could be a different lambda for this, all right? I don't care. I care about x, y, z. All right, so let's do it. Let's try and figure out which one of these is furthest, which one of these is closest. <clears throat> that might be a little tough. So my function 
f, I'm going to plug in, let me plug in the 6 over root 11, uh, 2 over root 11, negative 2 over root 11, and I'm plugging that into the square root of x minus 3, 6 over root 11, minus 3 squared. Do you understand where I'm putting this? 2 over root 11 minus 1 squared, negative 2 over root 11 plus 1 squared. And then I have to figure out what that is, right? And I'm going to cheat because I don't feel like using my calculator. I believe I already had my computer do this. I uh, thought I did. This turns out to be about 1.316, okay? And the other one, if you plug in negative, negative, positive, Okay, into this, the other one turns out to be 5 point something. So if you do F of, I'll stick with black, the green doesn't show up on camera very well. If I do F of negative 6 over root 11, negative 2 over root 11, 2 over root 11, you get approximately 5 point, I don't know. 5.31, 6. So this, this point right here, right? This point right here? Well, I should say this one. This one right here is closest, isn't it? And this one right here is furthest away. And both of these points live on your sphere. Got it? I can't think of another way you would do that problem without Lagrange multipliers at this point in this class. Like, that's all you've got. <clears throat> now, I, I do have a demonstration that shows you kind of like why Lagrange works, but because of time, I'm not really going to go into it. If you want to see it, you can come in my office and I can show it to you. It only works for, it, it's, a, it, it's a way to try and convince you that this works but it's only going to work for the two variable case, like f of x, y. Once you get past that, you just kind of have to, without get, you can't get into it visually at that point. OK, moving on. What did you all think of that one? All right? Sucked? Glad to be back? Yes, yes to all those? All the above. So I'm, I'm not doing quite a few problems here. Um, like I'm not doing these, these first two examples I was going to do in class, but I'm going to leave those for you. And there's problems in your homework that you'll get some more practice with this. The challenge again is going to be the solving of the equations. How are you going to go about doing that? There's no like always do it this way or, you know, you just got to play with it. <clears throat> How about this one? Maybe we can talk about this one without actually going through the whole thing. Maybe just set up what's the objective function, what's the constraint. <clears throat> Find the maximum volume of a rectangular box with no lid if it is to be made of 12 square meters of cardboard. Does this look familiar? This is a Cal 1 problem. This is a Cal 1 problem. You can do, it, do, this, you can do this with Cal 1. <clears throat> but it's easier, it's easier in Cal 3. It's much easier. Okay, so what are we trying to find the maximum of? Maximum what? Volume. What's the volume of a rectangular box? Length times width times height. So why don't I call it x, y, z? Is that okay with you? Does, it, does that make you happy that this is going to be a function of three variables? x, y, z? Yeah? Okay. Constraint. All right, so let's talk about the constraint. <clears throat> this box has no lid. <clears throat> There's your box. It has no lid on it, right? So you can put your hand in there. But it has a bottom to it. 
We know the volume, if we call this x and call this y and call that z, we know the volume is x, y, z. But it has to be made from 12 square meters of cardboard. That means the total surface area of this has to be 12, right? That's a constraint, isn't it? That's a constraint. What's the surface area of this thing? So what's the surface area of this front face? XZ. How about that back right there? XZ. So I know that two XZs plus, how about this side right here? Y times Z, this side, Y times Z. I know that two of those plus the bottom, okay? What's the area of that bottom piece? Just one of them, XY, because it didn't have a lid, right? That must be 12. Objective, constraint. You go to town now. Understand how that sets up? <clears throat> Actually, in uh, Cal 1, you couldn't do this problem. The way they present it in Cal 1 is they give you a sheet of paper, and you like cut out corners. Does that look familiar? Maybe you didn't. You may or may not have seen it. It just depends on your instructor and whether or not you got to it. But that's different because you're cutting squares out of the edges, and that's a little bit of a different problem. So, all right, let's look at another one. I'm not going to work through that one. Find the maximum uh, volume of a rectangular box with double bottom if it is to be made of 81 feet of cardboard with a double bottom. So it's the same picture, right? Except they're going to reinforce the bottom with two sheets of cardboard, which is the same as having a top to it, isn't it? Yeah. All that changes is this. And then this is what? 81? There you go. Same exact thing, right? Except change that to a 2. Or, uh, oh wait, it doesn't say it has a top. Does it say anything about the top? Just double bottom. So what do you all think? 3 or 2? I think three, don't you? They didn't say no lid, right? So we should assume lid? So it'd have a lid and a double bottom. So then that should be a three. I take that back. Thank you, Luke. But you get the idea, right? I mean, it's just a matter of interpreting the problem, converting it over to the, to the math now. We just did that one. OK. Now this, I don't have an example for, but I think I might do one. It just depends. I'm afraid to get into one because I'm afraid of how messy it might get. But let's say that you have a function of three variables, and you want to con um, constrain it, but give it two constraints instead of one. I'll give you an, an example um, just real quick, just thinking about it. Remember that sphere we just had, right? And we had a point, and we found the point, the two points that were closest and furthest away from that point. What if I came through, we know this has a constraint 